Yes, we're back. Episode 31 of the Hibs Ramble. Please do not adjust whatever you're listening to us on. Your ears are working. It is myself, Sean. I tell you what, don't we have a treat for you tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We are joined tonight by none other than Mr. Mark Duncan. Good to have you back. How you doing, my man? I'm good, mate. Thank you. I feel like every time I'm on the Ramble, I get just an unbelievable introduction and today is no different, so I appreciate that. Apologies to yourself and the, the listeners for going on a little bit of a hiatus. Um, there's some funny stories behind that, which if you go to Twitter, I'm sure you will you will see. But no, I appreciate it. I'm good, mate. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. Um, now, we are audio only this evening um, because it is just the two of us. Um, so due to technical difficulties... <laughs> We only have audio, and when I say technical difficulties, I mean I just don't have the facilities to do the video for uh, all our listeners out there. So I've probably done you all a favour, not needing to uh, look at us this evening. <laughs> um, yeah, so it is just me and Mark this evening, no Liam, no Craig. So tonight could be a bit of a riot. They're not there to keep us in our place, Mark. How do you feel about that? Well, I feel like it's our time to shine. We've got the two, the coast and the co-host are missing. So you've got myself and Yuna. I feel like it's our time to shine and prove why we are the superior hosts. This is us throwing our hat in the ring to be host next season. Well, uh, hosting duties was talked about on our um, on our Twitter space as well. So uh, they have really thrown us in the deep end here, Mark. <laughs> um, Liam's not able to make it this evening. Um, he's got things that are more important than a podcast going on this evening so um we send liam all our love and uh yeah craig um is also not able to make it tonight and i'm sure mark will have a few words to say about this but um craig has a knee ligament damage that he suffered from the weekend's match which i'm sure craig will fill you in about at the weekend um Craig probably isn't the only one that needs some hard drugs to listen to the two of us chat on a podcast, Mark. But um, yeah, we wish Craig a speedy recovery as well. I all the best, Craig. Hope you hope you recover shortly. Uh, right, enough of those two dweebs. Uh, let's move on to what was a massive, massive weekend for the High Bees. Big three points again. Um, before we get into the I don't even want to say nitty gritty because there isn't really too much about the game to actually talk about. Um, your opinion of it might differ from mine. I actually didn't think it was that great a game to watch. No. But um, two changes for the starting 11 for the Hibs at the weekend. Um, Cadden dropped and Egan Riley coming in. And McCurdy in for Nisbet due to Nisbet's injury, which we've now had news is um, hopefully not as bad as first feared and he could be back for our next home game next weekend against Kelly. Um, Mark, what did you make of the, the two changes and what was your thoughts going into the game on, on your way to, to Paisley at the weekend? Yeah, no surprise for the changes for me, obviously. Nisbet was an injury, so we knew that there was going to be a replacement coming in. I'm glad it was McCurdy uh, because I feel like you know he's shown glimpses over the last couple of weeks. He's not played full games, but he has shown enough uh, and I thought it was even harsh to drop him for the, the Ross County game. I thought he'd done really well against Aberdeen. Um, he's not got his goal yet, but I'm glad and I want to see him get that consistent run of the team, obviously. We'll talk about it, but he did get injured, unfortunately. But, you know, I, I was glad to see him getting, getting his run. Um, the other change didn't surprise me either. I'm not sure if he had picked up a knock, but um, Chris Cadden was, I thought, you know, although it was a, a really poor game on Tuesday in Dingwall, I thought Chris Cadden stuck out as has been particularly poor that game so it didn't surprise me and I was delighted to see uh, Egan Riley get in um, who was amazing I, I thought he was fantastic on Saturday and he done really well when he came on in, in, in Dingwall so no surprises for me I'm glad that we're now hopefully starting to see some consistency we've trimmed some of the fat of the squad hopefully Johnson is starting to get to know he's starting 11 we've, we've talked about that at length in previous podcasts we want a, a consistent starting eleven, a consistent shape, and hopefully that's what we're starting to see now. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that can he, that that level of consistency is what the, the squad kind of needed as well, and maybe a little bit of a little bit of extra love and an extra bit of belief from the, the the managers as well to say, listen, right, I prefer you in that position, and I like you here and there, and that's maybe why we're seeing the 
consistent team selection anyway. Um, there wasn't really too much. I mean, certainly I felt this anyway watching it in the house. I don't know if you felt this, Mark, but there wasn't really too many key highlights within the match. You've got Yuan, Yuan's chance that he steals off McCurdy in the first half. You've got McGeady's uh, free kick, which just misses the goal. Um, and we really didn't allow them to create too much either. Um, I would probably say there are only two opportunities. One of them comes from a mistake from McGeady, which plays in Maine, um, and he blazes that over the bar. He should be doing better for that. And the other one is Curtis Maine again, but that shot's always going wide. Um, did you ever, this is obviously prior to the, the, the change in formation and prior to our goal, but did you ever feel like we were actually under threat at all, Mark? No, I didn't feel like we were under threat. I also didn't feel like they were under threat either. It was very much a game that was played in the midfield. The only um, thing different to that was the first 10 minutes. I thought we were excellent opening 10 minutes. We were real, We were in control of the game. We were peppering our box with crosses. We won, I think, maybe four or five corners in that opening opening period to play. But then after that, they settled into the game and it became, you know, the conditions did get worse. It was windy, it was raining. And it was it was scrappy. There wasn't a whole lot of quality in there. And it pretty much stayed that way throughout the game. There was a couple of half chances here and there, like you've just mentioned. But there was nothing where I thought we absolutely should have scored that or they should have absolutely scored that. In the end, it was just that one moment of magic that, that won the game. So they'll probably feel quite hard done by because, you know, I, if I'd came away for that game and I'd been nil-nil, I, I wouldn't have complained too much. It probably was a, a game that, that you wouldn't have complained about a draw. Um, but that's what happens when you've got players of quality in the squad. It's just that one moment of magic is all you need. Yeah, I think um, certainly my opinion on watching it as well, I completely agree that um, it, was a, it was a poor game to watch. Um, do you think, whether it be the players or whether it be the coaching staff, do you think there was anything maybe learned from Ross County in regards to the perform the level of performance there because of the weather. I'm not necessarily to- obviously we should have won that game. That their goal should have never counted that away in Dingwall. <laughs> but um the actual level of performance and adjusting to the the weather, do you think there was anything learnt from the trip to Dingwall that they maybe implemented at the weekend there? Maybe on an individual level, I think, you know, particularly for the young guys, you know, Will Fish at centre-half, he was probably having to deal with the majority of the long balls coming that was impacted by the wind. Egan Riley as well, he only got maybe 10, 15 minutes in Dingwall, but he might have learned a few things. So probably more so for the young lads, they they would have taken some insight. It certainly wasn't as bad on Saturday as it was on Tuesday, Um, but I think they probably would have, have, have learned. I thought we dealt with the conditions really well on Tuesday, and like you said, it was unlucky that we came away um, having conceded that goal. So, yeah, I think they've probably picked up a few bits and pieces as a whole, though, that, you know, we've got a lot of experience in there. You know, your Paul Hanlon's, Louis Stevenson's, you know, they'll, they've dealt with that a lot. So, um, more so for the young lads than anything else. Yeah, and unfortunately, you spoke about McCurdy earlier on. He felt like he was coming into a game. I feel the same. I feel like it's no surprise that are we running, you know, significant game time has led to him maybe his confidence growing and, and having more of an impact in games um, but unfortunately he, he got injured, it looks like he's rolled his ankle um, at point of recording, there's talk about it being an Achilles injury um, so I don't want to dare imagine how long he could be out um, for but Talking about kind of putting the injury aside, because we we both kind of feel that the, the same about McCurdy. What benefit do you think that might have on on the squad in regards to the rest of the players that that, that we've got in those type of positions? Can you see the likes of uh, Josh O'Connor, Ethan Laidlaw, um, maybe even Ewan Henderson? I know you're not his biggest fan, but Ewan Henderson or um, our new signing uh, Matthew Hope or Hope, however you want to pronounce it, getting more minutes. Yeah, I mean, I, there's obviously pros and cons of any injury, right? Like, McCurdy getting injured, it's gutting. You know, I really wanted to see him getting a proper run in the team. I think that's what he needs. And I think once he gets that, or when he got that goal, I thought that would have been the monkey off his back and he would maybe, you know, come on to a game and come good for us. So obviously that's disappointing. But like you said, there's always a silver lining. And 
you know, hopefully it'll allow more minutes for the likes of Josh O'Connor, who, by the way, I think's done excellent in the cut. I know it's only been a couple of cameo appearances, but in that time, he's, you know, won us a penalty against Aberdeen. I thought, again, he done well on uh, on Tuesday in Dingwall. The new the new lad I uh, hope or, or hop, I'm just going to say hope. Um, you know, it allows him a chance, maybe a little bit too early. You know, I'm thinking maybe if Johnson, I don't know if he's fully fit. Certainly going by his performance, he looked like he did gas out a little bit, um, especially towards the end of the game. Um, so maybe it's a little bit too soon for him, but at the end of the day, he may as well get thrown into the deep end. Eh? And I thought he'd done all right. But yeah, definitely want to see more minutes for O'Connor and us, uh, young Laidlaw because they're absolutely flying for the, the under-19s. Um, moving on to what I felt kind of... Um led us to be more dominant in the match. I think, well, we were dominant throughout. Um, we, I know people don't like to dwell on, on stats when it comes to possession and completed passes and stuff, but we completed in the match twice as many passes as St Marin. They only had a pass completion of just over 50%, and we were we were rocking about a 75% pass completion. So I think a lot of that came into play when Johnson um, changed the shape or at least it certainly looked like it changed the shape to a 3-5-2 when he brought on um, Caden, um, brought on Ewan Henderson and brought on uh, Matthew Hop or Hop. Um, it looked like we went to the 3-5-2 um, with Matthew up beside Ellie Yuan to provide a little bit more support for him. Josh Campbell drops into the centre midfield position with, um, with Jago, who again was... Very, very solid for me. Really, really good, strong performance. Looks like the missing piece to our jigsaw, I think. Um, and and Ewan Henderson kind of had this free role as probably the role that kind of suits him best in the 10 to try and create whatever he could. Um, just prior to the goal, what did you what did you make of the, the change in shape? Did you, can you feel like it was only a matter of time till a goal came? Do you feel like we'd maybe grabbed the game by the scuff of the neck a wee bit more? How did you see that? I'm not going to lie to you, I was worried. <laughs> I was worried by that change because we took, I think we took McGeady off, didn't we, and put Cadden yeah. on. Yeah. And then we brought Henderson on as well. Now, I'm I'm probably quite harsh when it comes to both of those players, Cadden and Henderson, because I probably emphasise, not they're not poor, but I, I, I'm not huge fans of them, right? So when they both came on and we changed the shape, I thought, I actually turned to McClendon and I said, we'll be lucky if we get away here with a point. Because they also brought Tony Watt on, and I had just had this feeling in the pit of my stomach that Tony Watt was going to score against us, because he always does. Did you feel like, because of the conditions, Lee Johnson was trying to shut up shop and then maybe catch on the break instead? Yeah, well, I was it, when it first happened, I thought, I'm worried here, but I'm glad I was wrong, because I thought Henderson came on and played well. I thought he broke up play quite well, he drove us forward, and ultimately he got the assist for the goal. Um and I thought Cadden done well. His work rate was second to none. He, he won a lot of balls, especially when we were seeing the game out. He done really well in the corner at times to just run down the clock. So, um, as as critical as I was when he made that change, it was a brilliant change and it just shows how much I know. Um, <laughs> because it worked really well. We did start to take control of the game a little bit. And obviously, it, what resulted in a, a goal and the winner um, came from that change as well. So, I'm absolutely delighted that I was totally wrong, and uh, Henderson has gone up in my in my books. I'm sure he'll be buzzing that Mark Duncan uh, thinks a little bit more highly of him now. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Mark. I am a big advocate for Ewan Henderson, although he's not really done too much in a, a hip shirt. I think it's clear to see what attributes he has. I think it's just try to try to utilise them and get the best out of them. But um, yeah, speaking of of Ewan Henderson and speaking of of the goal. Um, what a delicious ball that was from him. Brilliant yep. ball in the I When I was watching it, I thought it was just a wayward pass. I had no idea, obviously, that LUN was all the way out there. LUN takes a couple of touches, quick cut in, big toe, t- uh, toe punt. Don't really see many finishes like that. Um, for me, that just shows how much confidence he's got just to, you know, it looks like a bit of a snatch at it, but it's a, a cultured finish, should we say. Toe punt. And um, before we get on to what was the madness behind the goal after it went in, what what, what was um, what was your thoughts on the build-up to the goal and the goal itself? 
It was really about, again, Henderson does well. He, he takes the ball and he drives forward with it. And I was the same as you. I thought he was actually playing it into Hop and it was a bit of a Hop and it was a bit of a weird, wayward pass. But he's actually, on reflection and looking at the replay, looks like he actually spots you on the far side of the pitch and plays a really well, a, a really good ball into him. And um, Yuan, I actually think the reason for his finish, and I could be wrong, the defender, I don't know if it was Gogic or whoever it was, but he takes it past him, he takes the touch past him, and the defender actually grabs a hold of him. Mm-hmm. So if Yuan goes down there, that is a foul. Like, that is a, a foul and potentially a red card. So credit to Yuan for staying up. But I think because he's been pulled back a little bit, you know, his, his body's kind of not in the right position to take a shot with it inside his foot. Um, so what he's done instead is he's toe poked it because he's he's almost leaning back a little bit and he's kind of forced into that shot. Um, I, again, I could be completely wrong there, but um, that's what it looked like from where I was sitting. And I, it's a brilliant finish. Hits off the post, goes in and cue the carnage behind the goals. Yeah, let's let's talk about that carnage. I know you're a big advocate for, for limbs, regardless of who it's against. Um, it felt like watching it on the TV that that, that looked like some serious serious limbs because of how frustrating the day was, the performance, the weather, and how badly we need we needed those three points. Um yeah, how 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 was it being in the mon- in and amongst all those limbs? Uh, you you do get you get real limbs and fake limbs, right? And you get that the, the organic limbs when it's a big game, right? And that had a big game feel. And fair player to St. they they sold out or they looked like they'd just about sold out the home end. We sold out the away end. It was, you know, if we won, we went above them. It's huge in our, you know, chances of getting to Europe. You know, with other results going the way they went, with Aberdeen winning, Hearts winning, it just made it even bigger. Um, so there was a big game feel, and I think it showed in the, the celebrations. We knew that it was an absolute must win. We had to beat St. Marin if we had any chance of getting to our top four. And uh, and we did that, and obviously it was a late goal as well, so it's always going to be absolute carnage, especially with the amount of fans there. Um, and even after the goal, it was brilliant. The noise was was just superb. I think I've even seen some Marin fans online saying that the noise was brilliant. So good to see us selling out the away end and getting a wee bit in return as well. Yeah, that's one thing that we've, we've we seem to continually do this season, regardless of performances. Take a very very good crowd. Absolutely. I also noticed that. Um, Celtic and Rangers are down to 6th and 7th on the highest attendances at St Mirren Park this season. So it just goes to show that St Mirren aren't just turning out for the Old Firm, they're turning out for our game yesterday, the two games against uh, Hibs this season, the Hearts one and, and Motherwell. So it's a, it's refreshing to see. Um, I know we've got a bit of a break between now and, and the Kilmarnock game, but I just want to get your opinion on Ellie Yuan. Um, we're seeing him played down the middle now and it will continue to be the case at the moment um, and he's not shied away from taking that responsibility on his shoulders some real, real good performances for him recently, Mark Yeah, absolutely he looks like he's just loving his football and we knew, even when he went through a bit because he started off really strong and he, he had so many assists and he just went through a wee bit of a dip in form um, but we knew that there was a player in there. He just was maybe lacking that confidence. And God, he's he's absolutely he's got an abundance now. It seems. Um, I actually personally prefer him playing out wide. But it's good to know that we've got that option. You know, we can play him out wide, or we can play him through the middle. I would prefer to have a proper number nine in the middle and then have Yuan and Megidi out wide, or or whoever the other winger would be. Um, but again, it's good that we've got somebody that we can trust and rely on to play down the middle or out wide. Yeah, I've, I've, it's gave me a lot of, of confidence. I am a big Kevin Nisbet fan. Um, and when the whole move kind of was going to happen, not going to happen, I was concerned about where we were going to be left. But the performance against Aberdeen through the middle, his performance through the middle against County, and again at the weekend just goes to show that um, he can step up when needed. And even when we change to the 3-5-2, he can still adapt to having someone else up there with him. And when we went 1-0 one, one up, uh, Matthew Hopkins he dropped into a ten with Eli Yuan behind him as well, uh, behind Eli Yuan with you and Henderson. So it's good to see that we've got a wee bit more freedom in, in our front three. I think. Yeah. Um, just touching on a couple of players that I've had at 
tough recent in, in recent months, um, but have gone a long way to shut those um, what do I want to call them? How do I put this politely? Um, naysayers is um, Paul Hanlon and Big Fish at the back. What was your thoughts on their performance? Because for me, it just screamed that they knew that they weren't getting beat at the weekend. They were confident in each other's ability and they were they were absolutely rock solid for me. They were brilliant. They really were excellent. And it, I sent a message on Tuesday on my way home from Dingwall. The takeaways from that game, one of those takeaways was that Hanlon has still got a bit of gas in the tank. Because I think that, you know, Hanlon and Stevenson are the two easy targets, right? When Hibs fans are unhappy with our form or our performances, those two are the ones that get called out straight away. And I think that's just because we don't know anything we don't know anything else. They've always been here, so they're an easy target. But uh, Hanlon was absolutely immense on Saturday and on Tuesday and against Aberdeen as well. Um, and I think he compliment they complement each other well. Um, I, I I thought I can't I can't speak highly enough of them both, especially Young Fish as well because he's taken a lot of criticism to come into to make a start in Edinburgh Derby and to make that mistake which led to a goal. A lot of fans were calling for his head. And then, you know, he's put in a couple of performances since, which weren't the best. But to bounce back for that, play in his natural position alongside Paul Hamlin, who's got all the experience in the world, and he'll just be soaking up knowledge left, right and centre. Um, and I fair play to them because they, they both do get it tight, but they've been immense the last couple of weeks. Yeah, especially with Will Fish. I've seen a couple of instances at the weekend where he found himself in similar situations to what he found, out, uh, found himself in in the derby. But he done the right thing this time. Uh, he knows what he's good at. He knows what he's not good at. And I think that says a lot about his character and his ability as well, that he he knows what he can provide to the team. Um, we can't talk about Paul Hanlon without talking about Lewis Stevenson. So um, 450 league appearances for the wee man. Uh, can't be underestimated his influence on and off the park. Um, and I think his recent performances as well is going to show that, that he's he's got some mileage left in him as well, albeit whether it might be 90 minutes. It's not going to be 90 minutes for 38 league games a season, but it certainly goes to show that when called upon, he certainly doesn't let the high bees down, does he? No, he's Mr. Reliable, Mr. Consistency. And again, he's an easy target because he doesn't set the world alight when he plays. We all know that. You know, he's not going to get you loads of goals and loads of assists. He does a job and he does it consistently. Um, but I, again, I thought he was really solid on Saturday and he's always there, right? Through thick and thin, whether we're playing well, whether we're really, really poor, he's always there and he always puts in a shift. So 450 league games is, I mean, unbelievable. We might never see the likes for a, a long, long time. Um, so incredible achievement, massive congrats. And just a wee thing, Hibbs posted that he made his debut on the 29th of July, 2006. So where were you at that point, Sean? How old were you in 2006? Uh, 2006. You said July, yeah? I would July. have been 13. Yeah, yeah. I, would have, I was nine. Yeah. Nine years yeah. old. 13. So what would that be? Would that be first, first year at school? Something like right. that? I don't know. Uh, wait, what? Wait, what year did you say? Two thousand and six. Two thousand and six. Uh, yeah. So I, I, right, okay. Just goes to show. So that, if you think back, that so I, I would have been in primary school. I would have been not about nine years old. And to think back, everything that's happened in our lives since then, throughout that whole time, Lewis Stevenson has been playing for Hibs, which when you put it in that perspective, is is pretty incredible. Yeah, I don't want to think about what I was doing when I was 13 anyway, put it that way. Um, yeah, what we'll do is we'll, we'll move on now. There's a, Obviously, there's a few people uh, in the development squad in the under-19s that I'm sure we would love to see push Lewis Stevenson and Paul Hanlon for those records. Uh, so we're going to talk about the, the young team now. Um, they've got a massive, massive game, what is tomorrow evening at, at the point of recording against Dortmund in the UEFA Youth League. Uh, are you going, Mark? Are you able to go? Or I'm not going, unfortunately. It'll be the first um, game that I've missed in terms of the European games for the under-19, so I'm a bit gutted, but um, 
I hear that there's five and a half thousand tickets being sold already, so I'm sure that'll be a brilliant crowd. Tremendous effort for the Hibs fans back in the boys, five and a half thousand. It's a five or a ticket, it's a seven PM kickoff, winner takes all, it's one leg. So if you've not got your ticket already, um get one and go. If you can't make it, the match is um on BT Sport two oh, as no well. Problem. It's been it's been picked for broadcasting purposes. If you don't have BT Sport two, um and you don't have a fire stick of, of, of any kind um, then you can also get it on the UEFA website because it's getting streamed on their site as well. So uh, we actually sat down and obviously spoke with Ethan and Josh a while back, Mark. Um, that was episode 22. For those that have not watched or listened to it yet, it's a tremendous episode. Not only did we talk about their, their, their run that they're on at the moment, we spoke about last year's success. And Mark got to know them a little bit more by talking about their teammates as well. So it's a really, really good episode. You should go back, listen to it if you haven't already. Um, Mark, I'm going to hit you with a bit of background about the game tomorrow and hit the listeners with a bit of background about tomorrow as well. So the the young team obviously won their league last year, so that took them through via the domestic path. Um, so you've got two paths within the UEFA Youth League, a bit of history for you all now. So you've got the domestic path and you've got the Champions League path so the Champions League path obviously is the teams that play in the the men's game it mirrors it mirrors that so Dortmund finished second in their group um behind Man City uh, they finished above Sevilla and Copenhagen so that secured them the playoff spot against Hibs if you won if they'd won that group they would have went straight into the last 16 um which is where Hibs will find themselves if they beat Dortmund tomorrow so it's 8v8 um, in the domestic and the Champions League path. Our potential last 16 opponents, should we beat Dortmund and get through, listen to this, Mark, some of these some of these names. Liverpool, Man City, Atletico Madrid, Barcelona, Real Madrid, PSG, Milan and Sporting Lisbon. That's the list of all the teams that won their groups in the Champions League path. So out of all the eight games that are getting played over the course of tomorrow and Wednesday, they will move on to play one of those opponents. Who would you like, should Hibs get past Dortmund tomorrow, who would you like to see the Hibs play? Liverpool. I'd like to see Liverpool so that they can scud them. (laughs) I'd actually like us to play like a Barca or a Real Madrid or a PSG or something like that as well. Just something a little bit more further away from home. Um, but yeah that's your history lesson on tomorrow's UEFA Youth League Um, get there, back the boys if you can, if not back them from your couch or wherever you may be watching the match Uh, so good luck to the boys I know a lot of them listen to the pod um, and hopefully they'll continue their level of success whether it might not be in the UEFA Youth League it may well be moving into the first team and getting some first team minutes as well which is what we all want to see from them Yeah, fingers crossed uh, so, Mark, we've got a little bit of a break between uh, men's teams matches. So we don't obviously have one this weekend. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it's the Scottish Cup that's getting played this weekend. Is that, so we I thought it was an international break for some reason. International, I think the international one's the next again break that we've got. So our next game is um, Kamarnock on the 18th at home. Now, we are actually unbeaten at home in nine games against them. I don't know if you know that it stretches it stretches as far back as 2014 when we last suffered defeat to Kilmarnock at home in a 1-0 defeat. So we've won six and drawn three. Um, we'll talk about the other fixtures that are played that weekend in a sec, but what's, I know it's quite far away, but what's your thoughts going into the Kilmarnock match? I think it's, well, it's certainly one that we would expect to win. Uh, Kilmarnock are a team struggling at the moment. However, we know that you know, the under Derek McInnes are never going to be easy, especially when they go away from home. I feel like they set up almost not to get beat, and we saw that in the last game. I think we only beat them 1-0, despite them having a man sent off. Um, they were really compact, they were really organised, and we, we did struggle to break them down for large periods of the game. So certainly one I think that we should win, we'll be expected to win. I don't think we'll win comfortably. I think they will make it a game. I mean, we, we we got beat last time we played them, but that was away from home. I think one thing that does benefit us <clears throat> is the break. 
Um, I know a lot of people will want to continue in that momentum and, and play as many games as possible, but I think there's a couple of young lads that have come in, you know, Egan Riley especially, you know, get them in, get them really um, used to the setup, used to training, play in that shape quite regularly in training, so that when they come back for the next game, they look even more organised and, and even better going into that. So I'm quite excited to see how a couple of weeks of solid training with the boys without any games um, helps and obviously it allows some boys to get back to fitness as well. Hopefully we see Kevin Nisbet back in the starting lineup, and I don't know what the update is with uh, with Kyle McGuinness. Yeah, well, Kyle McGuinness would probably be injured for God knows how long. We, we might see him before the split. Who knows? Mm. Uh, yeah, you touched on Kamarnock's away form. They've only picked up two points all season away from home, so it is something that we should certainly be looking to take advantage of. The last point that they picked up was before Christmas um, in a draw with Motherwell, I'm sure. It was a two-all draw. So it is certainly a side that we should be looking to um, exploit in regards to their poor away form, yeah. uh, considering our home form is actually better than our away form as well. Uh, I'd like to see us pick up another win, I think. What's important for me, and I mentioned this on the pod last week with Craig, is... It was important at the weekend there because of the teams that were playing each other. And it's even more important next weekend because we're playing Kelly, who are, in all all fairness to them, they're in a relegation fight. Right? That's that's unfortunately what they're going to find themselves in, and, and, and rightly so, considering the way that their away form is, for a start. Livy play Rangers, Aberdeen play Celtic, and Motherwell play Hearts. So, realistically we need to be looking at that fixture to to get the three points. Now, I'm not sitting here saying it is a must win. It is a should win, in my opinion. It's most certainly not. It's most certainly a must not lose, anyway. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how we set up. I do agree with you in regards to more time on the grass for the players um, and getting used to the rest of the teammates as well. So... I think we can both safely say that we're expecting three points from that. Uh, we should be expecting three points from that. And if we do, it'll go a long way to keeping the momentum going in the squad. Now, we have a break between now and, and the Kelly game. And then straight after the Kelly game, we've got a runny games where we play Livy on the 4th of March. And then we play, uh, play Rangers sorry, at home on the 8th of March and then we've got another break again where we don't play until this uh, don't play Celtic away until the 18th now what kind of impact do you think that might have on the squad as a whole do you think that'll have more of a negative impact in regards to not really getting a runny games going and maybe stopping the momentum or like you said earlier on do you think it's maybe better for them because we've just had the January window and getting more time on the grass yeah, I think the risk of playing too many games is obviously, you know, getting injury. And I think we injuries, um, and I think we've been quite unlucky for the last couple of years now um, with injuries. You know, we've we've lost a lot of our key players to major injuries. You know, you look at Kevin Nisbet, Martin Boyle, Kyle McGuinness a couple of times, you know, all have been out for sort of nine months to a year. Um, so for me, I think Lee Johnson will be quite happy that there is some breaks in between. Obviously, you don't want it to be too big because, like you said, then you lose that momentum. But I think with the with the group that we've got at the moment, like we said earlier, we've trimmed some of the fat off the squad. So we've now got a squad that should all be competing for places. So I think it gives some of the new guys coming in and some of the young guys that we've talked about, you know, your Ethan's and Josh O'Connor, all, all those guys, it gives them a chance to show what they've got in training and potentially stake their claim in the starting eleven. Um, so I, for me, it's a good thing, you know, for me getting that that break and allowing the team to gel even more with a squad of players that are all going to be there for the foreseeable. I think can only be a good thing. Yeah, and then when we do finish that break, we go on to play Livy away, which is notoriously a tough game for anyone. Um, they are doing really, really well this year. Uh, but again, teams around us are playing uh, tough opponents. Saint Mirren have got Celtic. Uh, albeit they play play them at home, but they um, that'll be a tough fixture for them. So it's another opportunity for us to gain ground on the the, the teams around us. 
Uh, and then even when we play Rangers at home, which again should be a great opportunity if we're still picking up points to try and nick something off them. Those are the types of games against Old Firm at home midweek that we should be looking to try and uh, make it more of a kind of toxic atmosphere and make it hard for them. Hearts play Celtic that night as well, so you'd be looking to try and close the gap on them. And then we've got another break until we play Celtic away, which again, I don't want to say it's a free hit, but the way Celtic are playing at the moment, it is really, really tough to see them dropping any points. But even then, Hearts play Aberdeen, so you're hoping Aberdeen maybe have their house in order by that point as well. So I think we spoke about it very briefly on last week's pod. I think it is vitally important that we just continue to play our game against the teams that we have in front of us and pick up as many points as we can and then maybe see where we find ourselves towards the end of the season just before the split. I don't think we're going to be in trouble at all and I do think we're still within a shout of of European spots. What, What do you think, Mark? Definitely, you know, I was never really, you know, I was never really looking down, so to speak. I know we went through some pretty tough and bleak moments in the season, particularly, you know, the back-to-back 3-0 from Hearts was obviously a low point, you know, being beat 6-1 off Celtic. There has been some low points this season, but I was never in doubt that we'd be pushing for top six come the end of the season. Um, I think we've got a good enough squad of players, and I'm even happier now that we've trimmed that down a little bit, and we've got a little bit extra quality, particularly with Jago coming in. I think he's made a huge, huge difference and he could be the the missing piece that we've been looking for since probably Marvin Bartley, to be honest, that allows some of those forward players to go and, and, and do their thing. Um, I'm confident that, you know, we can get fourth. I, I don't think we'll catch Hearts, unfortunately, as, as some of the listeners might be hating me saying that, but I think they've just got such a... a they've been progressing so steadily... And they're so consistent, which is where we are not at this moment in time. However, I do think that we should be looking at them and thinking they're not world beaters, but they're still finishing third at a canter, certainly last season. Why can't we do that? Because all it takes is a little bit of consistency. If you can take care, particularly at home, if you can take care of the bottom six, which you should be beating anyway, yes, you'll probably get beat more times than, than you win against the old firm and then you show up against your Aberdeens. And so all it takes is a bit of consistency for us to be where they are. So I think that's what we're, where we should be looking, um, is that certainly this season, top four. You know, look at the teams around us. You've got Hearts in third, but the teams around us, St Mirren, who we've just beat on Saturday, I mean, we are, we've got a better squad than St Mirren. Livingston, who again are one of the smaller outfits in the Premier League. Don't get me wrong, they're a really, really tough team. Um, but again, we should be beating them and finishing above them. And then Aberdeen are probably the, the biggest club out there, but they're in terms of our rivals. But again, I mean, they're, they've not got the house in order, like you just said. They're really struggling. They've just dispatched six goals, um, six nil against them. So, yeah, for me, fourth is realistic and where we should be looking for. Yeah, I think considering the fixtures that we've got in the lead up to the split, they do kind of should be looking to put us in a good position going into the split as well. So any momentum is key, I think. Uh, so what we're going to do now, listeners' favourite, Mark, we're going to move on to the Pioneer ship. Uh, I know you've got some updating to do. Um, before we get into the nitty-gritty of the scores, um, you had what would probably be described as a interesting trip to Dingwall as well. Um do you want to tell the listeners about your your lovely trip to Dingwall? Uh, yeah, it was it was interesting. Certainly, the weather going up and coming back was absolutely horrendous. And I was in the car with a an absolute madman, Patrick, who's probably not listening. Um, he was driving at silly speeds, um, going up and down that horrible road in in pretty terrible conditions. So that was pretty terrifying. Um, game. I mean, I wasn't going up there expecting a classic, to be honest, but. Um, Really disappointed that we came away with with just a point. I felt like we did enough to win the game, and the goal that they scored was was very very questionable. How um, it's not a foul? How VR's not given us that? They don't really give us much, I know, but how they've not given that? And Johnson actually came out and said he needs to to sign a bouncer to look after David Marshall after that, which is absolutely right. You know, there was three or four boys pretty much pushing him into the net into the south stand. Um, but one thing that I do want to update the viewers on, speaking of Pymership, is the pie 
which I had before the game on Tuesday in Dingwall. And I have to say, it was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely unbelievable. So I'm going to give temperature a five. Perfect. And I've already cited reasons in previous podcasts that I like it to be warm, not too hot, because I like to eat fast and it was just perfect. Price, I've given it a three. It was £3.50, which is on the more expensive side of pies in the, the cinch, but it was well worth it. Um, it was three pound fifty, so three for price filling. I've given a five again. I wouldn't have, I couldn't give it any more. It was a perfect filling, lovely steak, just beautiful crust. I've given it a four, um, nice and crisp on the outside, no sogginess on the bottom. Um, so yeah, overall score of seventeen for Ross County, which I think is a personal um, high for me this season. That is massive. That is. That is very, very good. I'm sure the the catering staff at Ross County will be listening to the podcast and I'm sure they'll be uh, brimming from ear to ear with their smile. Uh, Great, great score for the county. Probably helped considering the journey on the way up. You probably needed that pie more than anything else. So, uh, Right, what about your St Mirren one before we get into Liam and Craig's St Mirren pie? Well, going from an incredible pie on Tuesday to what I can only describe as an absolute disgrace on Saturday, St Mirren should hang their heads in shame. It was an abysmal pie, an abysmal pie. Temperature I've given a one because it was absolutely freezing cold. There wasn't a bit of heat to it. It was a stone cold pie. The price was £3.50, the same as what it was in Dingwall. For the same price, you've got an, an awful pie. So I've given it a one as well. Filling, I've given a three. There was a decent amount, but it was bland. It was just awful. Crust was soggy on the bottom, broke up. There was no real crisp on the top of it. It was pretty much raw, to be honest. Um, so that was a seven overall. So from a brilliant pie on Tuesday to an absolutely ludicrous pie on Saturday, to be honest. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll give um, Liam's one some airtime before we get on to Craig's, considering what Craig has said about the pie. So I think you and, you and Liam must have most definitely got one from the same batch because, and I think he's probably been a bit more generous with the, the temperature because he's went for a two for the temperature, but he says it was far too cold. Um, his comments probably make it a one, not a two, but hey, it's not me that judged the pie. Pastry, he gave a two. He said that was soggy as well. Uh, fill in. Now, Liam is our Ramble Piemeership expert, so he certainly knows what a good fill in a pie is, considering he only has Parkhead to tick off now. He gave the fill in a two, said below average at best. Um, it was all over the gaff. And price was two as well because of the 350 overpriced for a shite pie. His words, not mine. So that gives us a eight. Again, very, very poor by his standards. We will be releasing the Pioneership chart at the end uh, or at some point tonight or tomorrow once this goes live so you can see how Liam has rated the rest of the cinch pies. Moving on to Craig's, I don't really know where to start with it, if I'm honest, Mark. You can see it there in the chat. Um, he got a steak and black pudding pie, and I don't really know if I should waste my time reading this out, but I'm going to anyway, just for the listeners. Price, one. Okay. Overpriced, despite... <laughs> despite being pie... For a uh, pie of the month, sorry, Craig. Filling, so I was too busy reading the rest of it there. Uh, filling one, there was no bits of steak whatsoever. Um, gave him the book, let's just put it politely. The crust, <laughs> one as well. Lid of the pie looked tremendous. Needed a chainsaw to bite into it, like biting into a rock, which I'm sure Craig has done many a time. And temperature was a one as well. So that kind of just goes to show how bad the St Mirren pies were. Um, I remember last season I got a pie for 
the St Mirren I thought it was not too bad but going by the batch that you've got the weekend it was absolutely horrendous so that gives Craig's a four which is probably or it most definitely will be the worst rated pie so far this season you're not getting any worse than that that's no, for sure cannot get more peeps man jeez oh right Mark, what we'll do now is we'll move on to the listener question, the listeners' questions, everyone's favourite part of the show. Um, if you're if you're still listening at this point in the podcast, then very well done to yourself. Um, I'm just going to plug a few things before we get into the listener questions. Uh, make sure that you're subscribing to us on YouTube, following us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, the lot. We are um, upping our Instagram game at the moment um, where we will be providing match day content, whether it be journey to and from the game, pictures of said pies, and I know a lot of our listeners like to see them, uh, and some match day content in and outside of the stadium. There will be some match day content tomorrow at the match as well uh, by by ourselves on the Ramble Instagram. So if you're not already following the Ramble's Instagram page, give it a follow. Uh, moving on to the listener questions, Mark. So we'll start off with Jacks uh, wanting our thoughts on Egan Riley's performance, and he wants to know the best snack that you had on the way to Paisley, oh. if you had one. On the way to Paisley, well, first of all, Egan Riley's performance was absolutely fantastic, considering it was his full debut for the club. I thought he was immense. Um, the only I wouldn't even call it a criticism, um, but the only thing that you could say about his performance and about the fullbacks in general, him and Stevenson, was that they weren't particularly attacking. But the response to that would be their defenders first and foremost, and they did an, a brilliant job in defending. Um, that's what the midfielders and attackers are there for to go and attack. So I thought he was he was immense. I was actually driving to the game, um, so I didn't have any snacks. Uh, on the way, I did have a can of Pepsi Max on the way back, if you can count that. And how was it, Mark? It was warm and not very nice because it had been lying in my car. So <laughs> um, Keith hit us with a, has the January activity enabled Lee Johnson to find a more consistent 11 or is it too early to say? Now, you've already mentioned the consistency and I'll back that up again. Um, I think it is going to show that Lee Johnson's maybe not feeling, I don't know if you'll echo these comments, Mark, he's not feeling obliged to play people he doesn't want to play. Mm-hmm. He's now got a squad of players that he feels can actually provide a difference on the park, and maybe that's why we're seeing a consistent 11 as well. Um, John has hit us with the usual, what is for dinner now? Um, John, if you're listening, which I bloody hope you are, I don't want to comment on what you sent us for your dinner when it was your birthday the other night. I'll, we'll wait until we have a full pod to discuss that, because if I speak now, I will be in trouble, is, is all I'm going to say, okay? Um, I'll, I'll need to go and look at this now, I'm intrigued. I wouldn't have wasted your time, put it that way. Sorry, John, but geez, well, that was... Do you know what? Nah, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to... Nah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Um, I'll be having... No doubt a creamy pasta dish tonight. I don't know what it will consist of, but um, I know that that is one that we have lined up. What about yourself? Well, I am on a bit of a health kick at the moment. Um, So my personal trainer has set out um, quite a lot of guidelines for how much protein and calories I need to have. So anyway, to answer your question, I will be having salmon fillets with some rice and a little bit of teriyaki sauce with some vegetables on the side. Oh, it does sound nice. A wee healthy dinner tonight. That's so nice. Um, Doogie's hit us with a question that I can only assume is for Liam. Uh, was it the best two hours of your life sitting, ne- sitting next to me in the bowling club? Uh, Doogie, I'm going to go with no because Liam did not mention it to any of us. So he did mention it to me. He did mention it to me. He mentioned that he had met a listener in the bowling club before um, and that McClendell had declined an autograph is what I'm hearing. Brilliant. Brilliant patter. Um, Fergus, with the run of games ahead, are we still able to challenge for fourth? And we've both said yes to that. Um, we've got to be confident in our ability. And how good was Ellie Yuan? We've touched on that as well. So, brilliant, brilliant stuff. Long may it continue. Um, Ewan's just said sign Ellie Yuan on a permanent deal if his form like this continues. I think we can both agree with that, depending on what 
the sum of money is. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if you know, Mark, what the amount I've, is. Yeah, I've heard anywhere in, well, I've heard a couple. I've heard somebody say 500,000 and I've heard another person say 750,000. So bear in mind, 750,000 would take us into the region of breaking our record transfer fee of De La Cruz back in, what, 2001? Yeah. I think it has to happen eventually. We need to, to have a marquee signing where we do spend not far off a million pounds for a player. Is El Ewan the man to do it? I don't see why not. He's young, talented, you know, he's on a brilliant form. He knows how to play in the Scottish League now. You know, he can clearly play. So, yeah, I, I don't see why not. I don't, I don't see why we shouldn't break the bank for him, to be honest. He's um, only going to, he's, his value's only going to go up as well. And more importantly, his Instagram game is unbelievable. Yeah. So that alone we should sign on. Um, Jack, opinion on Hop's debut? You, you mentioned earlier on, Mark, what was your kind of overall riding of his of his performance? Could you see some real quality there, albeit maybe lacking match fitness? I think, yeah, the, the opening, when he first came on, you know, for maybe 10, 15 minutes, he looked really quick and he looked really sharp and he looked like he would make a bit of difference. He did fall flat a little bit. I am not going to, I'm not going to criticise or, or, or anything like that because he, his effort was second to none. You know, he ran about all game. Even when he was he look, he was visibly knackered, he looked like he was just he couldn't run anymore and he kept going. Um it's very early days. I don't think if it had been Johnson's choice he wouldn't have played him. You know, he's only just signed, he's not trained much, he's probably not match fit, he doesn't know the Scottish game, especially in those conditions. So I think it's really, really hard to judge him off that game. But I think we could have a player on our hands. We just need to be a bit patient. Uh, Lorenzo, uh, constant contributor to the pod, so big love to Lorenzo. Um, is Fish and Hanlon our future centre back pairing for the rest of the season? Uh, now, I personally think it, it most likely will look that case. I think for me, um, it looked good that we were able to switch to a three-five-two when required at the weekend, um, and still cope as well with uh, Egan Riley filling in there. Uh, Stevenson could sometimes fill in as a left-sided of the three as well um, and we've obviously got Mikey um, Devlin uh, still training with us at the moment so we'll need to see what comes from that I'm sure there's maybe a free agent out there as well somewhere so uh, what's your thoughts on the pairing Mark? Yeah I mean it was looking a bit bleak in terms of injuries and stuff obviously losing Ryan Porteous losing Rocky through injury um, you know not having those signings in it did look bleak our defensive situation given that we were shipping so many goals but um, yeah, I just hope that Fish can stay fit. I definitely think him and Hanlon are the, the pairing um, that are to be separated, so to speak, you know, for the rest of the season. The good news is if we unfortunately do lose them due just because of game management or through injury, you know, you've got Egan Riley who can move into the centre and then put Chris Cadden at um, full back. So um, we do have options. And like you said, we've got Devlin that can potentially slot in there as well. Yeah. Um, Gav Dick again just saying how good was CJ CJ Egan Riley. Um, do you think with um, you know, do you think that Cadden will find it hard to get back in the team? And also thoughts on Hop. So I've already mentioned Hop. Do you think it could be difficult for Cadden to get back in the side? Or I mean, it was bold for only Johnson to drop him, uh, whether it was injury or form or whatever. It does give us a, a lot of strong options down that right hand side. Yeah, look. I've not been shy in saying that I really do not like Chris Cadden as a right back, not as a player. You know, I like Chris Cadden as a player, just to be clear. But as a right back, I'm not a huge fan. Um, defensively, I think he gets caught out far too often. I don't think he stops enough crosses, and I just don't think defensively he's great. So I think he'll struggle to get back in at right back. However, it gives us more options in the attack. You know, could he go into a midfield position if we were playing five in midfield? Could he even move you know further forward on the pitch you know if he starts putting in some good attacking performances because we know that he's he's crossing is really inconsistent right he puts in a lot of really really poor crosses but he also can put in some really good good passes and, and crosses so if he can stay consistent in his attacking game I think there is still a place for him I do think that he will struggle to get back in from a defensive point of view. Uh, last couple uh, John wanting to rate the limbs. Now we've already spoke about the limbs, but we will more than happily talk about them again. Um, is the, the th- were those limbs up there for you? What talk about away day limbs for me, Mark? For a second, what what springs to mind uh, recently in regards to top away day limbs that that we've had? 
And and where does that St Mirren come close to that? This season, um, I think there's probably only one limbs that's been better, which was Ibrox. Um, for me, that'll be really, really hard to be topped. Um, we haven't had any celebrations at Tigas, unfortunately, <laughs> which probably would have been top. Um, but Ibrox for me was top. Um, I think that is certainly second, with Motherwell probably being third. Uh, and last question from Neil. Um, which Hibs player for you was sold too early that you would have wanted to have kept for the duration like Lewis Stevenson and Paul Hanlon? Now, while you have a think about that, Mark, some of the names um, that were mentioned were Alex Cropley, uh, which again, we sadly cannot comment on that. Um, you've got Andy Gorham, John Collins, uh, Gordon Jury, Scott Brown, John McGinn, Gary O'Connor, Stephen Fletcher, Didi Agat, great, great name there, great one to, to mention, um, Derek Rardin, and some absolute weirdo has mentioned Chris Muller. I'm sure we can guess <laughs> who that was. Um, Mark, what about you? What player... Now, for me, I, I'll, I'll let you answer it first, but for me... When I saw that question, I initially thought more of an academy product instead of someone that we've, we've brought in. Um, but who would you have liked to see during your time supporting the Hibs to have been there as long as Lewis or Paul? If you're talking non-academy product, I would have to say John McGinn. Um, I think he was outstanding when he was at us. He was probably the best player in our best team um, that we've had in a long, long time. So definitely, John McGinn. In terms of an academy product, I'm going to go with Scott Brown. It would have been Derek Ryder or Gary O'Connor for me. However, I think their off-the-pitch antics maybe would have hindered them even if they'd stayed at Hibs. So I think Scott Brown, total professional, um, he would have been a top, top player at us for a very long time, just like he was at Celtic. So I'll say Scott Brown. When I was thinking of, of non-academy products, I was actually thinking about Lee Griffiths, um, considering how close we came to signing him on, on many an occasion. Uh, but obviously, his off-field antics may have hindered that as well. But to have someone of that ability, considering how many goals he scored in a very, very poor hip side, it would have been interesting to see if, if, we, if we had got him real young and, and kept him. Because he bad goal when he was younger anyway, bad goals wherever he, wherever uh, he was until everything else. Um, I actually thought about Stephen Fletcher. Yeah. as well, but uh, I feel like Stephen goes under the radar a wee bit in, con- in, in comparison to other players that came through around the, the time just before him, so um, it would have been interesting to, to see where we'd maybe be if we kept him for yeah. th- that length of time. Um, he's had a great career, obviously. Uh, he even played for Bloody Marseille as well, so um, he certainly got about. Um, that is us, folks. That is episode 31, finitoed. Thank you all for listening if you have made it this far. Um, if you haven't, well, jokes on you because um, I'm yeah. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for listening. If you haven't already, uh, get interacting with us on social media Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Send us abuse, questions, compliments, whatever. Uh, just keep the abuse for Liam and Craig and the compliments for, for me and Mark, of course. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for joining me, Mark. Take care, and everyone have a good week and weekend when it comes. Cheers. Cheers.